Hi, it's Paul Anderson. I wanted to make a screencast on how I make screencasts. So this is going to be a little meta at times. I made a similar video 10 years ago, and a lot of the software and hardware really hasn't changed that much in the last 10 years. And so let's call this the decennial edition, or better yet, the coronavirus edition. I'm getting tons of emails from teachers and want to know how do I make these videos because they want to make ones of their own. And so this is the 10 year anniversary, hopefully the next one in 2030 I make in virtual reality. But before we get to this, why why do I make screencasts? I think all teachers should make at least one or two screencasts each year. And the reason why is I make a lot of videos just on how to use software, how to use websites. And so if you've got a Google Classroom and want kids to know how you submit assignments, for example, I use them for tech demos, like this is a Zoom tech demo, for example. Or maybe we're doing a lab and I want to record a lab maybe with my document camera so I can share that with my students remotely then I just record the screen and then I share that with them. But then a lot of us are using them for instruction. So kids don't wanna sit through a 40 minute Zoom as you read through your slides. So just making short, less than 10 minute instructional videos so they can get to the content when they need to get to the content. And so to make a screencast, you really just need three things. The first thing you need is a computer. And this is the computer that I'm looking at right now. I'm on a Mac, but you could do these on PCs or even a, a tablet if you want to. Now I've added a few things over the last 10 years. And if you were to buy one thing to add, I would argue that it should be a microphone. So I got a relatively cheap USB microphone 10 years ago. I'm still using the same one. If you don't want to do that, you can get one of those headphones with a microphone uh, on it. And it just gives you better audio quality. Um, your students will think they're better and they won't know why the video is better and it's just because the audio quality is, is a little bit better. One thing I've been using a ton lately is an old iPad with an Apple Pencil that I never used. Um, and then I'm using software called Desk Scribble. I try not to buy software unless it's really worth it. And this $10 piece of software is the only one I've found that can kind of do, let me show you what it can do. And so you can highlight things. So I can write with my pencil on the screen, I can highlight different things, and I can get really precise. So I could write my initial or my uh, signature and then share that on the screen. So it's recording all of that and then I could just wipe that off. And so I find the iPad is really nice, especially even in a, like a remote uh, learning. So if we're doing a Zoom meeting or a Google Meet, I can draw on the screen and highlight different things. And I'm not just using my mouse. You could also use a graphics tablet if you wanted to do that. I've started to use a document camera that's just connected to uh, my computer so I can share things in, in real that are just not using the webcam. And so um, you don't have to get a nice document camera. I have an IPvo one, but just use your phone, hook it up or put your iPad on a, a pile of books. And so you can film what you're doing. It allows you to take, in my case, my science lab to where the students are. And then I've always been a big believer that you should put a video of yourself in your videos. And so years ago, I bought a Logitech webcam and then behind me, you can't see it, but there is a green screen. So this is what I look like if you were to look over my computer. And then I can get rid of that later and so I can just sit on top. And that way you don't have to worry about what you have, like them looking at your uh, wall or, or your bedroom if you want to. So after we're done with that, the next thing you need is some content. You need to be able to talk about something or put something on your screen. I use Keynote. If you're not familiar with Keynote, Keynote's just like PowerPoint on a PC or Google Slides. And sure, let me, let me show you my keynote. And so we're here right now on, on this third slide, but this is the slide that I already showed you. This is slide one and slide two and slide three. And so what I've done is prepared the whole talk beforehand, just like I was gonna lecture to my students or talk to a group of teachers. I just make it ahead of time. You can really get in the weeds if you're trying to edit videos that you share with kids. And so I just record what's on the screen and then talk to the webcam as if I was talking to you, which I am. Um, when it comes to images, I love Wikipedia because a lot of them are licensed under public domain or Creative Commons, so I can give attribution to that and I don't have to worry about um, copyright on any of the images that I use, and they're really good. Um, so this would be uh, an image of the most recent coronavirus. And so using Wikipedia, I'll even Google image Wikipedia and then whatever I'm looking for and then find good ones that I could use. And then lots of times I'll end up just drawing things that I'm going to add in. So if I'm going to get a water molecule, instead of searching for that perfect image, I'll just draw one. And what's great about it is if I add that and I can change color, I can modify it. And this is just added in Keynote. Keynote's great because it has this feature called Magic Move. Let me show you what that looks like. So this would be the slide that we're on. 
And so what I have here is, I don't know, about 20 copies of this water molecule. And then on the next slide, I'm just putting them in different positions. And then I use this transition, just it's called magic move. And let me show you what that'll do. It's just kind of magic. What it'll do is it'll move those water molecules around and then I've moved some of the content off to the right side. So it looks like I'm really good at animation and I'm not. I'm just putting different, the same material on uh, subsequent slides. And so I could say, let's dig into hydrogen bonding and I could just twist all of these around and then that magic move makes it a nice continuous animation. And I use that all the time. And then the last thing you need is screen recording software. So this whole time I've had a piece of software that's recording everything that's on my computer screen along with the audio and the video that's coming through my computer. There's a ton out there, Screencast-O-Matic, Screencastify. You can do some in just PowerPoint. If you're on a Mac, you could just use uh, QuickTime Player to record it. Um, TechSmith Camtasia. I've been using ScreenFlow for the last 10 years, and so I'm just used to using it, and it'd be hard for me to switch at this point. Um, this is software that I have to pay for, but I really love paying for it because it's super easy to use. And so let me show you what that looks like. So imagine I'm done with my presentation right now and I want to start editing. So it's been running the whole time. So up here, I'm just going to stop the uh, recording and uh, then I'll have to start another recording to show you what happens after I've uh, stopped recording. Okay, so I've stopped recording and I'm recording what happens after you hit stop record. And so what you get is an old school just video editing software. So the first thing I would always do is save it. So I've saved this as screencast and then uh, start editing. So what I can do is I can just change the video to fit that. So I can just move this in and out. You can see, for example, that there's a little pop-up that comes up here for my drawing software, so maybe I don't want to show that, so I just kind of move that off screen. And so that would be my track. So this is going to be what students are going to see. So we could say, like, let me play this. And this is me just practicing before I started recording. So maybe this part I want to get rid of. So if I want to get rid of this part, I could just cut it out and just so like, let's lose this part. I could get rid of that. Um, other things we could do, um, you'll notice in my videos that I'll put my head in the corner. And so I could make my head a little bit smaller. And, and then I could maybe trim some of this off on the side so I could crop it a little bit. So like that. And then I could crop the right side. You can see there's that green screen that was there, but I could add a video filter so I could get rid of that green screen that's behind me. And now I'm just floating right here. Um, other things I make in virtual reality. that I would normally do is maybe get the volume so it's at the right uh, level. So if I go to audio here, I could smooth the volume levels. And it'll just go through and if I was talking too loud or if I was talking too soft, then it's going to level out all those volumes. And so before we get to this, why do I make screencasts? So there we go. So this is basically how I do the editing at this point. I don't want to get into the specifics of ScreenFlow, but know this, that all software kind of works the same way. It records what's on your screen, records your video, records the audio, and then you can make edits later. Uh, what I would encourage you to do is save it locally so you have a copy of that, and then put it on YouTube. Um, what's changed my life is putting videos on YouTube and then getting feedback from people on YouTube, but you can always put them on YouTube unlisted and so kids can get it. But I don't think you want to upload your videos to an area where, um, where it's kind of locked in whatever they have and you not having a copy of that. I think that's an important way to kind of future proof your videos. And so that's how I make a screencast of making a screencast. I'm going to take another 10 minutes and then edit this and put it up on YouTube. I think if you're a teacher, the one thing you want to do is don't waste time on a ton of editing. Um, don't let perfect be the enemy of good enough. Just make a video, put it out there for your kids, make another one, listen to the feedback. I never look at my videos. I find it horrible to just edit and look at myself. And I think we all feel that same way. But you're going to make a world a little bit better with you share that, if you share that with not only your students, but students elsewhere. So that's how I do it. And I hope that's helpful.